May we bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, may your word come alive to us. May we understand what it is you want to say to each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. And the passage that we had read is on the back of the notices. So at the beginning of chapter 7, just before our reading, Paul has an exciting way of talking about becoming a Christian. He wants to show the difference being a Christian makes. And he describes it in terms of marriage. And he says, before we became a Christian, we were bound in a relationship like a marriage, bound in a relationship to the law, to the commands of God. However, being united to the law was not good news because we couldn't live up to what the law demanded. It was a relationship heading for disaster. But to use Paul's analogy, we escaped from that disastrous marriage. How? Well, Paul in verse 4 says, We died to the law because the demands of the law were fully satisfied by the death of Jesus on the cross. The law no longer has any hold on us. And Paul says because we died to the law, that leaves us free for a new marriage. Free, as he puts it, to belong to another, to belong to him who raised us from the dead. Sorry, to him who was raised from the dead. We have escaped the clutches of the law and now belong to Jesus. And I hope that sounds incredibly good news to you. But for the Jews, for Paul's listeners, this was a really hard message to swallow. Because they've been brought up to really love the law and take a huge pride in their relationship to it. The law to them was more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. And yet here is Paul painting such a bleak picture of the law. So that's why we get the start of the passage we had read. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? And Paul's answer is, certainly not. So what is Paul saying about the law? Well, in the earlier chapters of this letter, Paul has shown that no human has ever succeeded in keeping the law. Therefore, the law can never be a way of salvation. Instead, it almost makes things worse. Because the law defines sin for us. Without it, Paul says in this passage, without the law, I wouldn't have known what sin was. And Paul then tells us a story. Although it's his story, there are, I think, deliberate echoes of it being a story for everyone. Let's look first at how it specifically relates to Paul. Paul says there was a time in his life when he felt alive apart from the law. But then, as he says in verse 9, the commandment came, sin sprang to life. Now this is difficult to follow because Paul, from his earliest memories, would have been taught all about the law. So what's he saying? Well, he talks about how one commandment brought home to him what the law was really all about. It made him realise that he fell far short of keeping the law and actually stirred up all sorts of desires in him. And that command was, you shall not covet. The Ten Commandments speak of our outward duties, at least nine of them do. Like, don't murder, or steal, or lie, or work on the Sabbath. They may not be easy things to do, but they're doable. Paul elsewhere talks about how in his life, He viewed himself as blameless with regards to the law. So there was a stage where he felt, I kept the law. And I don't know about you, but I've met people, a curate, not this present one, said that to me. She said, I I find it difficult on Sunday in church. I can't think of anything to confess. I didn't know what planet she lived on, really, because I could always think of plenty of things. But 
And the strict religious Jews were diligent in keeping their laws. And they felt they kept the law and they were probably very proud about doing so. But you shall not covet relates to internal things, our desires, what goes on in our head. It's a different and much harder sort of command. And it's at the heart of what the law is all about. And Jesus sees this and he says to his followers and to those listening, you've been told not to commit adultery, but I tell you, looking lustfully at someone is just as much a breach of God's command. Just as being angry with your brother or sister is as much a breach of God's law as murder. And once you realise this, as Paul came to do, you realise you are lost. Because each one of us knows that in our hearts, in our heads, we entertain all sorts of desires and thoughts that fall way short of the life God intends for us. And it's an every man story because Paul harkens back to the story at the beginning of the Bible. There was an age of innocence in the Garden of Eden when all was well and then God gave the command not to eat from a certain tree. Sin, represented by the snake, sprang to life and seized the opportunity offered by that command. It deceived Eve, stirring up her desires. Disobedience brought death into Adam and Eve's world. A famous theologian from the past, Augustine, describes it with this story. Near our vineyard there was a pear tree loaded with fruit. Though the fruit wasn't particularly attractive in colour or taste, I and some other youths conceived the idea of shaking the pears off this tree and carrying them away. We set out late at night and stole all the fruit we could carry. And this wasn't to feed ourselves. We may have tasted a few, but then we threw the rest to the pigs. Our real pleasure was simply in doing something that wasn't allowed. I had plenty of better pairs of my own. I only took these in order that I might be a thief. Once I'd taken them, I threw them away, and all I tasted in them was my own iniquity, which I enjoyed very much. A modern preacher, Tim Keller, comments, We have a deep desire to be in charge of the world and of our lives. We want to be sovereign. Every law that God lays down is an infringement on our absolute sovereignty. It reminds us that we're not God. In its essence, sin is a force that hates any such infringement. It desires to be God. What was the first temptation from the serpent in the garden? You will be like God. That was the essence of the first sin. And it's the essence of all our sins. So once again we come to the question, is the law the baddie in this story? No, no, says Paul. It's we who are the baddies. The law is good. It's from God himself. But we must recognise what the law is for. The law may be good, but it's not able to save sinners. On the contrary, it shows us that we are sinners. The law may be good, but it doesn't give us any power to change our lives. And sometimes our whole approach to Christianity is wrong. If we think it's about teaching people to obey God's laws... We're wrong, because simply telling people what the right thing to do is doesn't give people the power to obey, to change. It's like if in our Sunday clubs, if all that we're telling our children is to be nice to each other, to be respectful to parents, not to lie, to help those in need, well, those would be all great things to say, but such teaching does not 
change lives. It's by telling them about God's grace and love. It's by telling them about how God gives us his spirit to help us live for him. It's by those things that our children's lives will be transformed. So then what is the law good for? For so much Paul would want to say to us. Because as we read the law of God, it shows us what our God is like. The law is his character written down in a series of guidelines or precepts. You and I are to be merciful. Why? Because our God is supremely merciful. We are to think of the poor. Why? Because God thinks of the poor. We are to be faithful in all our relationships because God is faithful. We are to be truthful because our God does not lie. The law is wonderful. It enlarges our vision as to what we should be truly like. It shows us what life in all its fullness should be. But it does not give us the power to change. We need God's spirit for that. And now we come to the second half of Romans chapter 7, which has divided Bible-believing Christians down the centuries. And I feel daunted at commenting on it. But I think the stakes are high. I think there are real dangers if you read this passage the wrong way. So there are three key ways people have looked at this passage. Some have said, this is Paul talking about his pre-Christian experience, before he became a Christian. Because how else could he say in verse 14, I'm a slave to sin? After all, he's just been celebrating how he's no longer a slave to sin. How could the Paul who, as we heard in chapter 5, spoke about the peace, joy, freedom and hope that the justified people of God enjoy, how could Paul describe himself in verse 24 as a wretched man? Who will rescue me from this body? He must clearly be talking about the time before he became a Christian. That gives you a, a taste of the argument. Now, in a moment, we'll consider the argument against, but just suppose they were right. This would be really bad news. Because I meet many Christians who still feel in slavery to sin. They do not seem to break free of its bonds. Time and time again, the same sinful desires come back with the same force and they give in. Perhaps not all the time, but they do sometimes. And they feel wretched. They long for rescue. And if you say to such people, well, actually perhaps you're not really a Christian, then a number of them might say, you know, I've often wondered that. I'm such a miserable failure as a Christian. Perhaps you're right. The real truth is, I was never a Christian at all. That, to my mind, is pastorally disastrous. We need people, sorry, what people need who are struggling is assurance. For them to know that it's not a matter of them holding on to God, but that God has hold of them and will not let them go, however much of a failure that they feel. So yes, I do have a reason for wanting this interpretation to be wrong, but I do think there are very good reasons for believing it's not right. And one is that whereas in the previous verses Paul's been clearly talking about the past, now as you read it, all his verbs use the present tense. It really looks as though he's talking about his present experience. And also... He's clearly talking as a Christian because in verse 18 he says he desires to do what's good. In verse 23 he says in his inner being he delights in God's law. Are those not clear signs of regeneration? I would certainly say that. But there is another interpretation. Some may want to say that the experience Paul is describing is of someone who's not fully grasp the gospel. This is not a healthy, mature believer. This is a person who hasn't learnt the role of the Holy Spirit. And I can see some merit in this, but again I think 
There is danger. It's, to my mind, a dangerous half-truth. If people want to say that in the Christian life you can get beyond the stage where you feel that sin still holds you, and that you feel from time to time like a wretched person, I want to say, no, you don't get beyond that stage. I certainly, standing here as your vicar, have not got beyond that stage. I meet many people who are wearing themselves out, desperately rushing headlong into every new teaching, and thereby sometimes exposing themselves to error, all in attempt to break free of such feelings and to move on to some higher level of the Christian life where this is no longer t- true, where they've completely broken free of the pull of sin. And this failure to break free after a time in such people who are to- always looking to break free can be so exhausting that they give up. They've tried so many different ideas and none of them have worked and they feel bitter and cynical about the whole Christian thing. But I do think there's a half-truth here. And I think if we read chapter 7 on its own, we're in danger of ignoring what chapter 8 is all about, which will be coming to in coming weeks, namely the work of the Holy Spirit who gives life. Though we may experience still the strong pull of sin, though at times sometimes we may be brought low by it, this should not lead to us giving up. God has given us his spirit. We can find a victory over our sins. But in this life there's no permanent victory. There will be times when you and I fail. Live with it. We should not aim to fail. We shouldn't give up trying because we sometimes fail, but neither should we beat ourselves up so much as though it was a huge surprise when sometimes we fail and give in to sin. Because if we spend ages groaning on the ground, feeling miserable wretches, that's not got what God wants. We need to get up off the floor quickly and start battling again. God loves you. He wants to quickly lift you and me out of the latest mess that we've found ourselves in. As it says in verse 25, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.